back on Rebel Headquarters. Now joining me, Zed Jelani, he's a reporter for The Intercept. He's previously worked as a former communications and outreach coordinator for United Republic, um, senior reporter, blogger for Think Progress. He worked uh, at the PCCC. Uh, Zed, I get the sense that you might be a progressive. Uh, you know, I, I, there might be a few clues there, so. Yeah. You know what, uh, I, I'm gonna start in an interesting way. I, I really wanna talk about your uh, stories covering progressives and fake progressives and mid-level progressives. Uh, but first, I wanted to ask you about your old place of work, Think Progress. Some mm -hmm. interesting stories coming out of there recently. Um, what's your take on Think Progress having worked there? Well, it's kind of interesting because uh, it was basically an institution within an institution because Think Progress uh, was a weblog and newsletter based in the Center for American Progress, which is a think tank which houses particularly Democratic Party officials, um, almost exclusively Democratic Party officials. Um, and I think when I worked there, uh, you know, Faz Shakir was my boss. Uh, you know, he along with Amanda Turkle, you know, helped found it, and Judd Legum helped found it. Um, and I think, you know, we often kind of took positions that were a little bit uh, off center from our, our folks, sort of in the think tank, and sometimes that caused a little bit of dispute. Um, but I think Faz did a really good job of, you know, pushing to keep it independent um, because the think tank, I think, sort of had more center type politics or democratic establishment politics, whereas the mostly younger people worked at the blog and we were trying to push the envelope. Um, and, you know, I haven't worked there since 2012, so I wouldn't know as much about what's happening today. But I think, you know, the people who work there probably would tell you they, they still try to have that, that ethos. All right. Okay. Just wanted to check in on that. Mm -hmm. um, so now, um, let's start with uh, your story about uh, Sri Tanadar running for governor in uh, Michigan, because that's mm -hmm. super fascinating. And then we'll get into some of the other candidates out there. Uh, sure. he, he says, and he's got a lot of money uh, to, to say it with, uh, that he's the most progressive Democrat running for governor and that he's a fiscally savvy uh, Bernie Sanders. Uh, in your reporting, do you think that that is accurate? Well, it's interesting. So Thanadar is uh, was sort of a businessman in Michigan. Uh, he's spent a ton of money. He's loaned six million dollars to his campaign. He spent two million of those dollars on TV, and now he's actually either leading in the polls or he's number two in the polls. And a lot of that is based on branding and saying he's like Bernie Sanders. He supports fifteen dollars minimum wage, single payer. I think it's convinced a lot of people. But what happened was a number of consultants who met with him prior to announcing for governor told me that he actually considered running as a Republican. Uh, that he wasn't really sure where he was on the issues. He was considering being pro-life, for instance, like he said, that would be fine with them. Um, and when I asked Thonadar in an interview about this, he didn't entirely deny it. He didn't, he didn't say that he was ever going to run as a Republican, but he did say that he didn't tell his party to these consultants when he was meeting with them because he wanted to save that for later when he announced. Um, and, if, and, you know, I talked to him a lot about sort of his political background. He really doesn't have much of, of a background. Uh, he's donated to some politicians, some Democrats, as well as uh, John McCain, a Republican. Um, and so it's it's a very unusual sort of history for someone who who basically proclaims himself as a Bernie Sanders type guy because a Bernie Sanders type guy would probably be using his millions of dollars to support progressive candidates, uh, progressive social organizations, and ballot referendums, but he's never done any of that. Um, and so yeah, I think that story really put a big question question mark over his candidacy. And I think that uh, it really did say something that four different you know sort of prominent Michigan consultants were able to go on the record with me and use their names and put their credibility at stake to tell me that he had told them uh, that he was even considering running in the Republican uh, Party. Well, so what do we think is the game here? I mean, if he uh, is trying to figure out which party has a better chance of winning in uh, and won't say what his policies are before he formulates, okay, I got it, this is the best path to victory, mm -hmm. to, but to what end? Well, that you know, that's a good question because some people say, well, you know, if politicians are opportunistic, that's fine. Eventually, they'll come around to where we are. But you have to understand, in every stage of the process of politics, people, opportunists, have different incentives. So right now, he has an incentive. Uh, he's going up against a guy who actually has a number of Bernie Sanders staff, uh, Abdul Sayed, who's a progressive. He's going up against Gretchen Whitmer, who was a state senate leader, is a longtime Democrat. So right now, he has an incentive to say he's progressive, to say he's a Bernie type guy. He may not have that incentive in a general election. He certainly wouldn't have that incentive when he's governor and facing up with a, a fairly sort of moderate conservative legislature and so on and so forth. So I think that, you know, for him, it may very well end up being that he's just doing what he thinks he needs to do to win. But that isn't necessarily going to describe how he's going to govern. For instance, uh, I didn't put this in the article, but I talked with him for some time about single payer. And I kept asking him what his plan was, and he really didn't have a plan. 
And, you know, that's a huge undertaking for a state to establish uh, one sort of statewide uh, single payer health insurance system. And he doesn't have any plan to do it, but he says he's going to do it. Uh, he even told me that he prefers the federal government just do it and they get it done instead of the state, which isn't necessarily what he's saying on the campaign trail. So I think really you do have to push candidates, uh, you know, kind of put their their nose to the grindstone, so to speak, because uh, it's easy to talk one way during an election, a heated election, but it's a very different way. Uh, it can be very different from where how you actually govern. And I think that's a huge question mark with this candidate. Yeah, and uh, by the way, just so people know, Abdul Al Said is a just Democrat. He's one of the guys running against him. Just letting folks know that, just in case. Um, but uh, one last question about this: It is uh, interesting, though. Whatever this, how do you pronounce his name? Shri. Shri Thanadar. Thanadar. Whatever Shri Thanadar's motives are, it is interesting that he has calculated that the best path to victory is to have really, really progressive positions. Not what Washington says, Oh, you know, just be a Republican light, tell him you'll give a couple, just a little less tax cuts to the rich. He has calculated, no, if you actually want to win, you should have Bernie Sanders type of policy positions. Yeah, and remember that Michigan actually probably hates Hillary Clinton more than the average state, considering Bernie Sanders won very surprisingly in the primary there, and then very surprisingly Donald Trump won there in the general election. So I think Thunder probably made a very rational calculation that, hey, this state actually really likes Bernie Sanders style politics. It uh, doesn't like establishment Democratic politics, and honestly, it doesn't like establishment Republican style politics either. Um, so yeah, I think that is definitely an interesting fact, although I don't think I would I would take that fact to describe uh, this gentleman's politics where he'd actually be elected. Yeah, I got you. So th then uh, I know we're running short on time. I want to have you back on more and more because this is great stuff. Uh, let's just talk uh, real quick about one more race, which is the governor's race in Ohio. So uh, you've got an all star showdown there in Dennis Kucinich versus Rob Cordray. So, it, it, including me, what is a progressive to do? Uh, how do we weigh those two different progressives? Yeah, so I mean, I you know I, I don't I don't really make endorsements and races or anything, so I, I can't really tell people how to vote. But um, it is an interesting dynamic because I think when Kucinich got in, a lot of people underestimated him. They didn't really realize he'd have as much strength in the race. But I think there's a few issues. One of the issues is that Rob Cordry uh, had an A from the NRA when he was Attorney General of Ohio. Uh, he doesn't support an assault weapons ban, um, and I think after the tragedy in Florida, that's become a really big issue for Democrats. And Kucinich actually not only does he support the assault weapons ban, he's always had an F from the NRA. He actually started recruiting volunteers to go to uh, their local towns or city councils and try to pass resolutions calling on the legislature to pass an assault weapons ban. So I think he really rode that issue to where he went up in the polls. Um, and I think Cordry, you know, for most of the campaign, he didn't even have an issues page. He just like started putting up some issues recently with like the election a few weeks away. Um, so I think Kucinich kind of caught people by surprise just because he was offering a lot of progressive substance, um, you know, saying there should be a public broadband network in Ohio, um, talking about public works and uh, talking about banning fracking. Um, and I think the fact that Cordry just didn't have much of an issues page um, or much of an issue position is really what hurt him in this race and why it's Kucinich is making it a real a real fight going down to the primary. So for folks who don't remember, Cordry uh, was the head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, a big ally of Elizabeth Warren. So is there any reason to doubt his progressive chops on the financial front, You know, holding the bankers accountable, et cetera, what he's known for? Well, well, it's funny, um, when Cordry left the CFPB, he kind of put it in Trump's hands because his term was going to end in June 2018. Um, so you could make an argument that he actually he was kind of friendly to the industry by leaving. And actually, a number of people in the industry have given him money since he left. Like the head of the Mortgage Bankers Association is funding Rob uh, Richard Cordry's campaign um, in Ohio. So you know, I, I do think as CFPB chair, he did a number of things they didn't like. But by leaving, he kind of gave them the advantage because Mick Mulvaney has, has sort of taken over. And also, he doesn't really have any strong economic plans um, as part of his gubernatorial campaign. I think he's definitely positioning himself as kind of the moderate candidate in the race. And you know, maybe that's what a, a, what's politically palatable in Ohio, and who am I to say? But I, I don't think I don't think he's really trying to be the left candidate in, in this race. I think Kucinich has definitely carved out that space. Although that is an ironic uh, uh, you know, criticism of Cordray that he was so tough on the bankers that when he left, they're like, oh, thank God, here's some money, thank you for leaving. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, okay, uh, finally, I don't know if there's been polling on that. I haven't seen it. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, do we know where uh, they stand between Cordry and Kucinich right now? 
There was a poll, I think, late last month that had them tied, and now there was a poll that had Cordry up over Kucinich, but there's a huge number of undecided people in that race, like, I don't know, 40 or 50% or something. So I think it's very unpredictable, actually. All right, well, it's gonna be super exciting because that Ohio primary is coming up, uh, it's in May. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna cover it live, of course, on the Young Turks as we do on all the election nights on, on the primary nights. Uh, it's, it's gonna be a thriller. Uh, all right, Zed Jelani reporting for The Intercept, uh, covers these issues uh, as well as anyone in the country. Thank you for joining us, we really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Zach.